welcome to Casual Buddhism. I'm your host, Cindy Rossico, and we're joined with Venerable Dhammananda Pikini, who is Thailand's first fully ordained Theravada nun. Tonight, our guest is Lee Mars. She is a co-author of the best-selling book, Golden, The Power of Silence in a World of Noise. Uh, Lee is a collaboration consultant and leadership coach for major universities, corporations, and federal agencies, as well as a longtime student of pioneering researchers and practitioners of the ritualized use of psychedelic medicines in the West. So, Lee, welcome. And I just want to ask you, um, what inspired you to write about the power of silence? Mm. Thank you for that question. I, I think it will probably not surprise you all too much, but the abundance of noise, I think, was the was the inspiration. The actual feeling of despondency that both Justin and I were having in our work. He was working in DC. He has been a legislative director for three members of Congress and working hard on issues of climate change and thing and all kinds of important matters. I was doing a lot of work with NASA, with um, other chemists who are chemists who are trying to remove toxic chemicals from our products and environment to get them out of our bodies and our environment. And we were both scrambling doing this work and feeling the intensity and the urgency amplify and the need to get the message out amplify. But our intuition that may, was maybe that we needed to turn to silence to sort of quiet ourselves to be more effective, to discern the best course. And then that just led us into a big, a long exploration. We wrote an article for Harvard Business Review that, that went viral. People shared it widely. It was called The Busier You Are, The More You Need Silence. And um, they titled it that. We titled it something way more verbose and hard to relate to, but they titled it that. And, the, and that was something that caught people's attention. That business audience caught their attention. And then we decided... Maybe there's something to explore here. So we just started having conversations and asking people questions. A few questions I would love to ask you, vulnerable, that I asked the many dozens of people, because we come at this not as experts. We're just learning, um, asking people things like, what's the deepest silence you've ever known? And it was their responses that led us to write this book. That's wonderful, you know, particularly coming from United States. I, I find American people are very noisy, noisy and vocal. You know, you, you go to conferences, international conferences, the one who would be raising their hand to speak is nobody else but, but Americans. Yeah. And, and sometimes, you know, they speak out of lots of information, but uh, often, often uh, I feel that they still need the depth of the issue, uh, mm. and, and unless and until uh, they allow themselves to he to have this silence, that depth of the issue will not arise, will not emerge. I look at the plant. I look at the plant. You know, when you you put a little a seed in the soil, mm. that is that you need that silence. You need that moment of silence, darkness in order for this life to come up, you know. So silence, it's impregnated silence, you know, not silence without nothing, but right. silence which mm -hmm. is full of, full of everything. Yes, that's my favorite type of silence. <laughs> <laughs> Pure potentiality. Yes. yes. Mm. Mm. Well, we did ask this question. I would love to ask you. I just mentioned that we spoke to all kinds of people. So certainly beautiful teachers of different spiritual lineages, but also neuroscientists and also politicians <laughs> and also business people and also a man incarcerated on death row, uh, Jarvis J. Masters, who's a Tibetan Buddhist who's been finding his quiet even in that very loud environment and he becomes a primary teacher in the book to speak to how to find silence even in that environment mm. 
Um, and maybe I'll just say one more thing for framing and then I'll ask you. Um, we talk about noise, auditory noise in our ears, but we also talk about informational noise and all that comes at us through our screens these days um, and the mass proliferation of information available to us. And then we finally look at the noise inside our heads and so how to find quiet, not just in the surroundings, but how do we find quiet in here? Um, so, but we would never have known to do that if not all these interviews pointing us in this direction over and over again. So Venerable, what's, what? well, actually, let me ask you, what is silence for you first? You, you know, uh, you know, when we do practice of meditation, Venerable Paripurna is sitting with me here, uh, you know, we always remind people that the mind, the mind has two major functions. The first and primary function is just simply to note to know things as they are. And then the second second function is to think. But what happened to us? We get caught in this thinking process, thinking and spicing up our think, our thoughts. Uh, and and to all, in, in order for us to return to the primary stage of the mind, it's difficult. Mm. It becomes difficult, even though it is there all the time. You know, you just simply note. Take note of things around you as they are, mm. as they are. But we jump already to say, oh, I like Lee, you know, I like the, the way she dressed. I like her hairstyle. I like the background. You know, you go to details of, of many other informations. That is secondary. That mm -hmm. is secondary. The primary uh, information for us is simply to note without my liking or disliking. You know, so we have to retract ourselves to that original mind, which just simply do the simple function of noting. So this is a practice, which sounds so simple, but it is so difficult, so difficult. <laughs> yes, and once when we get back to that stage, you know, you, you may be sitting for one hour, but you would have a glimpse of that stage of that, the mind that is just noting, maybe half a second. Mm -hmm. Only half a second you could experience it, but it's there. It's there, and you could call that you could call that a real space, real space of silence, real space of nothingness. I would say, but this is you know the practice that, that takes takes a long time, long time for us to simply get back to the original nature of mind. Mm. Mm. I realize I'm, in talking with you that probably we directed our questions towards silences we liked, <laughs> you know, a preference, yeah. you know. Yes. <laughs> but maybe I can ask you the question of just of a deep silence that you can recall that you would, wouldn't mind sharing with us. Uh, that that space, that space you could call space. You could call the silence. is really uh, no you and no I. Mm. That, you know, that, that, uh, that separation between you and I is removed, but it's not there from the beginning, you know? Mm. But we created this, this line of uh, separation between you and I. So when we actually get to that, that stage, we realize that there is no you and no I, simply, Simply, it is. Simply, it is like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so uh, once, once in a long while, when I could draw myself back to that that original mind to to actually allow things to be without me interfering it, without judging, without judging, and that is a real, real space, real silence which nourishes, it nourishes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. I love that you keep referring space too. I feel I relate to that. It's such a, it's hard to even pinpoint what silence is, but spatial makes sense to me that there's a space and that time dissolving 
even though that's that little bitty sliver of a second, it doesn't matter, right? It's it does, the timelessness is there. It's nice to step out of time like that from every once in a while. <laughs> every once in a blue moon. Mm. And then that which is that which is suffering, that which we call suffering, is actually coming from the part of the mind that the mind is already uh, doing the secondary job of thinking, of uh, of judging you, judging me. You know, as as soon as I have this I, me, my mind, all that comes. You know, so. Yes, to go back to the to the mind with that that space that that is no you, no I. That is really uh, a blessing that Buddhist, if they truly practice in their tradition, doesn't matter whether it is Vajrayana, whether it is Mahayana, whether it is Theravada. It's all there for us. Mm. I'm appreciating this moment of silence. <laughs> and Lee, I was going to ask you, and I'm sorry, I don't remember if you said it in the book, but what is your most profound experience of silence? Well, I do say something in the book. I point to a moment, a difficult moment after giving birth to my daughter. I didn't sleep for uh, 25 days after she um, was born. I just was completely revved up and it's like the sleep, I would lie down and then I would just pop back up and then start cleaning the grout in my kitchen and writing thank you notes. And I was in a, you know, hypomanic state uh, for a while and then things started to fall apart and I had more of a psychosis of, of um, voices that said, oh, well, you need to record everything and then you can think your way out of this problem. And, and that became like a escape room I couldn't escape out of <laughs> and the mind was just feeding on itself and then paranoia and then you know just many many voices in my in my mind but I, I sat down in a therapist office a, a psychiatrist I call him Dr. T in the book and he simply asked me have you lost your witness and for some reason this question made sense to me and all those voices whoosh, parted like clouds and, and then just blue sky mind, I felt just clarity. And I could feel the, the silence holding me. And I felt quiet from all those voices and I could give him an answer. Yes, only once have I lost my witness, only once. And at that point in time, I felt great comfort in that silence coming in and holding me and was you're talking about a friend coming in to support like at this perfect time but it was silence that did that for me that told me mm -hmm. I would be okay I would have a beautiful relationship with my daughter our relationship would endure our my marriage with my husband would endure something so much was communicated in that silence so that's not a silence I tried to create of course and not a noise I tried to it just sort of came and um healed me in that moment and it was a long road to full recovery but that's one of the it wouldn't that question what's the deepest silence you've ever known when i asked that over and over again of course justin and i felt we we must answer that question and that moment in my life is what came, kept coming up even though it wasn't typical a typical answer like a remote monastery or you know un high mountain untrampled snow those kinds of answers which are beautiful mm -hmm. but this is what felt true to have all those voices all that insanity frankly and then mm -hmm. and then to be in a different a very different person after that so, no, Lee, Lee, Lee tell me more about that witness mm. I didn't quite understand that witness that the doctor asked you yeah so I don't know why I understood it but in the moment it made sense there was like the part of me that's seeing me in this life that's uh. tracking me there was only one moment where I felt completely untethered from reality essentially so I could say that with some clarity so I think it's about 
there's a sense of a tether to reality. And it wasn't important. It wasn't a it wasn't an egoic, important kind of that kind of me. It was just like that I am, that I exist. And for some period of time, I guess I was a little unclear, but the rest of the time I was very clear of my existence in the whole connection of this web of life. It is also something I'd heard referred to in some of the work I'd done um, with Ralph Metzner, my teacher in, with psychedelics, to just have, to be witnessing what is happening, you know, and to, to not take so many medicines that you're blown away, yeah. but to stay yeah. very present to everything, all the, the thinking and the feeling yeah. and the sensations. And yeah. so it's just a certain amount of presence, I think, is one way to say it. Is yeah. that making sense? Uh, yes, 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 yes. Oh, oh yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm just making it up. <laughs> It makes me it brings me comfort that it makes sense to you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your experience. And thank you, Venerable. And I think this is a nice place to close. So I will um it was a very rich conversation. I'm gonna replay this and listen to it again. Mm -hmm. And I thank you again, Lee, for coming on and thank you, Venerable. And we will see you again next week. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Venerable.